Hello everybody, welcome back to the Cincinnati Junior Sabbath School Show. My name is Sean Juma. We are in Lesson 6 for both PowerPoint and Cornerstone Lessons. Before we start the lessons though, if you don't already have copies of the Sabbath School books, you can go check them out at www.juniorpowerpoint.org and cornerstoneconnections.net. I think you can go and check them out. The title for our PowerPoint lesson is Nehemiah's Journal. The power test can be found in 1 Samuel chapter 12 verse 24 which reads but be sure but be sure to fear the lord and serve and serve him faithfully with all your heart consider what great things he has done for you the powerpoint is wherever you are we serve when we share what we what we know about god also the cornerstone lesson is true power. The key test can be found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 3 and 4 which reads don't don't let anyone deceive you in in any way for the day for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs in and, and man in man of lawness lawlessness is is revealed he will he will oppose and will exalt and will exalt himself over everything that is called god or is worshiped so that he sets up god's temple proclaiming himself to be god thank you very much thank you very much for joining us i hope you can stay tuned for a powerpoint and cornerstone lesson and discussions. God. Hi everyone, my name is Dorothy and this is Sensei Junior Sabbath School and we are live on Hope TV Ghana Sundays at 12 p.m. and Tuesdays at 3 p.m. CB Radio Ghana every Monday at 7 p.m. and on Abroad TV every Monday to Friday. So we have, as guests, we have Rayonda and Ariel and our special guest is Elder James Arhim. We at first we will have Ariel give us the PowerPoint summary. Lesson six: Nehemiah's the journal. In year twenty, a man and his friends saw the wall of Jerusalem. They were broken down and the gates were burned. A lot of the residents returned. They were suffering too. They had no protection with the walls. And no one knows how this happened. The next day, Nehemiah wasn't. The next day, Nehemiah wasn't able to eat ever since they told him about the gates and the walls. The next few days, he couldn't eat. He couldn't sleep. He could. He was only crying, and he prayed about Jerusalem. He could not only cry and pray about Jerusalem. He tried not to look distressed at, while at work. The next day, he confessed his sins, including his family, to God. He said that he, they've been acting wickedly towards God and they also de disobeyed him, so he asked for forgiveness. He also, he also prayed for God to give him courage and the chance to, to talk to the king. He trusted God would inspire the king to let him go back and build Jerusalem. While he was serving lunch, the king mentioned how sad he's been looking. How could he how could he tell anything was wrong? He's been trying to hide it, but the fasting and crying has caught up with him. He also couldn't blame him for asking what's wrong. He was afraid for his life. But 
He told him about Jerusalem. He's been waiting four months to ask him. He asked him directly. The king asked him directly, what do you want? He said and told him what he wanted to go back to his homeland to rebuild the walls of his city. He, he, he said, he asked him questions of as how long would it take and when he would be back. Maybe the king could help him even more. He took a deep breath and asked him for letters of instructions for the governors of the province on the way and the timber for the walls, the gates, and the houses in which he could live. He gave him everything he asked for. He even sent him with military escort. God is good. He decided not to tell any anyone except for a few men he brought with him about his plans for the last night. They got up in the middle of the night to inspect the city. The city was even worse than they thought. Everything was destroyed, Every everybody, Everybody, he said, people, priests, nobles, officials wanted to help. He told them what God has done so far, and the king helped him. How the king helped him. When he finished, he said, let us start rebuilding. And they got their tools, and they started today. Of course, Simbala, Tobia, and their new partner in crime. Jenison, the Arab, Arabic, heard about what they were trying to do. They tried to accuse accuse him, they try to accuse him. They know nothing about the, the close relationship with the king. Nehemiah tried to ignore tried to ignore them. No way they were going to stop him. God will give him a success, a success he said, amen. 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 So our first question is, what helped the Israelites decide to start rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem? after they listened to Nehemiah's message? Um, Ariel. Because they have heard what God has done, like lead the Israelites out of Egypt, so everybody wanted to help. Okay. Rianda. I guess it was the motivation that came from the message from Nehemiah. I'm not there. Oh, okay. Um... Considering what happened before the Israelites were able to rebuild the wall, you see, there are certain things about Christianity and about worshiping God. The Bible is one of the powerful tools that we can use to convince people to know that God is alive and He's able to do everything. And there's another thing, it's about testimony. When we're able to testify God with evidence, what God is able to do for you. It makes people around you to know that if they have issues, no matter how big that issue is, they are able to also go to God for, for help. So Nehemiah came to the Israelites with an evidence based on uh, what he prayed to God and asked for. God gave him uh, a letter and then again the king also gave him an escort. So that was a big evidence for the Israelites to know that no, our issue, God will be able to, God will be able with, is able with us and everything that we're going to do is going to work for us. That was why they were convinced that God is with them. Amen. Our second question is, what reasons do you think Nehemiah had to be afraid of the king? Ariel? The king, because the king could do anything to him like kill him or arrest him because he wanted to help the Israelites and rebuild the um, walls of Jerusalem. Okay. I think that Nehemiah was scared of the king because I guess he didn't want to get thrown out of the city. Mm. Elder? You know, in those days, uh, if you happen to work in a palace, like the position of Nehemiah, he was a cup bearer for the king. And as a cup bearer, you are next to the king in so many ways. First, you have to make sure you taste the drink that the, uh, the king drinks, the food that he eats, everything that goes on in the palace, you are in charge of it. So, like uh, going to the king in that mood, it's like you are insulting the king. It's, a, it's an insult. And the least punishment that you could get is being in prison. The worst is to get your head cut off. So for him to 
go to uh, the palace in that mood, it was a big blow for him because he didn't know what to do. But one thing that he did that all of us and as Christians we should be able to do is that he prayed before going to the king. So the way the king saw him and the way he called him, he said, this is a sorrow of your heart. So it's like when we pray before God in every step that we take, as the Bible made mention, Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 6, we should not lean on, on our own understanding. But in everything, when we acknowledge God, He will be able to, to direct our path. So certain things that we think it is too hard for us to uh, do, when God comes in, everything is going to be very good for us. Amen. Well, I think that he was afraid because he didn't want to get thrown into jail or probably killed. So if that was me, I wouldn't be happy to go. Our third question is, what are some examples of God's promises and how can we find them in the Bible? Ariel? One example of how God kept his problems was that he made a covenant with Abraham. He said that he would bless Abraham and his descendants so that all the families of earth would be blessed. And you can find it, you can find it in Genesis 12, 1 to 3. One of God's promises is that he promised us everlasting life. And if you go, you can go to either Genesis, you can go to Psalm, or you can go to Ephesians, and it will tell you about what God's promises and what you need to do to meet those expectations and requirements. Now, to, the best way to know about God's promises is to read about His Word. Everything that God has said about His promise is in the Bible. So that is the best source that we could go and, and read some of the promises that God has promised for His children. Just like when we read Isaiah 41 verse 10, it talks about, Do not fear, I will be with you in all ways, I will guide you. When we read, uh, like, um, Jeremiah 33 verse 3, it also talks about another promise. Jeremiah 29 verse 11, they all have a promise that when we base ourselves on it, it's going to work for us. So the best place to go is just go and read the Bible and get the promise of God. So one an example of promise is in the Ten Commandments when God promises everlasting life if we honor our father and our mother. So if so if we just like obey our parents, we have everlasting life. Um, our fourth question is, do you think Nehemiah, Nehemiah's prayer model is a great prayer model and why? Ariel? I, th I think his prayer was great because he prayed how he's been sinning and disobeying God. And I think some people can relate to that because whenever you pray to God, uh, whenever you pray to God about sinning, he forgives you. I think Nehemiah's prayer model was a good prayer model because he was basically, the way he prayed, it was powerful and allowed God to help him in his situation. Okay. Uh, I think that, that that is a good model that all of us could follow, especially when you're by yourself and you want to pray. First, you need to thank God for your life and everything that God uh, has been doing for you. After that, you need to confess your sins then maybe do intercession for uh, other people. Then maybe put your request before God. Then claim His promise that He is able to do everything. Then you thank Him. I think that is how individually we should pray as, uh, as that of Nehemiah did. Amen. I agree because if we, His prayer model was to pray to God, confess your sins, claim His promises, and then ask Him to meet your needs. So if we follow that, that model, we can become better Christians and we can follow his word to the detail. Um, now we will have Rianda give us the Cornerstone Summer. Okay, so in the Cornerstone Summer, there was a beast, a race that came out from the sea. It had 10 horns and there was a crown on each horn. This beast made it his mission to make the, kind of, the um, people fear him and make the people worship him. Suddenly, there was a second beast that came to come and basically reflect on what the first beast did, but do it even worse. And he made sure that all these people were scared of him and they were basically using God's image and putting them on themselves. So what I learned from this lesson is that 
if you are a true believer in God, you shouldn't go and pray and worship in any other image except for him because when God comes, he won't listen to you if you say, oh, there was a person that presented himself as God and I just um, followed it because I thought it was God. Okay. So our first cornerstone question is, what are your key thoughts when reading this passage? When I firstly read the passage, I thought it was like, these people were being ridiculous because in the commandments, God said, you should not have any other God before me. And I feel like they were basically worshiping this beast as if it were God. Okay. Ariel, what's your understanding? Uh, um, like not worshiping other idols and so not worshiping other beasts. Uh, what, what came into my mind? Uh, when I, after reading this uh, passage, it's about worship, and you know, the book of Revelation, especially at, uh, chapter 13, talks about uh, there's going to be a power that is going to rise up to change the laws, especially when it comes to the days of worship. So, it is something that we Christians should be very uh, critical about it and make sure that whatever the Bible says concerning the worship of God use what is special in the bible okay well my first thought my key thoughts when reading this passage it makes me think of different spirits or different people trying to um get the idea that they're superior but then as i continued reading continued reading i thought that it wasn't really about an animal so i thought it was more about us as people and how people want to come above each other and try and um, assert power into the world. Okay, our second question is, in the beginning of the passage, what would you describe as the beast? Is it an actual animal? Me, I don't think that the portrayed beast was an animal because the devil has its ways of deceiving people. And I truly feel like the, that beast was represented as the devil. Ariel? I think I think the um, animal was the devil because how they described it in the story, they said the it had horns and stuff. Okay, Elder? Okay, uh, in the book of Revelation, especially the 13th chapter, it uses a lot of symbols. And when the Bible talks about beast, it's talking about authority, it's talking about kingdom, it's talking about uh, a power that will come at the end of uh, the world. So it's describing a power that will manifest itself uh, at this end time. So it's not an actual beast or animal that uh, the Bible is talking about. It's talking about power. It's talking about uh, mighty hands that will uh, change things uh, at this end time. Amen. I also don't think it's an animal. I think it's um, people and trying to get power over others and the devil too. Our third question is, how would we prepare as Christians for all these events? So, um, Ways you can prepare for this type of situation is praying beforehand. Even though you don't know that's going to happen, you should still have faith in God and you should be able to not turn your back against Him. Amen. Ariel? I think we should pray. We should pray to God for help. And we should also pray for the people that are worshiping these false gods. Yeah, that is why as we Christians, the Bible has already given us a warning. Just like the text that we read in Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 and 4, it says we should not be deceived. And so it's something that has come beforehand, just like the Bible says it was written as an example that we should follow. So every warning that the Bible has given to we as Christians, we should know that it will definitely manifest itself. And so we should just hold on to our face and then just focus and we know that at the end of the day we'll become victorious. Amen. 
I think that we should also. I think that we should also um, follow the model, Nehemiah's model, to make sure that we have a path that is clear enough for us to um, swerve all these events. And if we continue to pray and to read our Bibles, it will help us secure um, a place in heaven. Our fourth question is, knowing all the truth in the scriptures, is it enough to think that we are saved? No, it is not enough to think that we are saved because you can't just go out. Let's, for, for example, you go out and you drink and you think, oh, God has me. God will cover me. God will not cover you because you decided to go and do that thing without even thinking about how it would affect you in the future. And you didn't even think about going. You want to go do that thing. That's why you need to pray to God and you need to worship him and do all the things that he wants you to do so that in the future you'll be, you will be saved. Amen. Ariel. Knowing the scripture is not enough. You have to have faith in God through Jesus Christ and obey and also pray to God. We also have to confess our sins. For example, if we go to church just to get to heaven, we are not saved. We need to obey and follow God's instructions. Yeah, I would say yes and no. Uh, knowing the truth is okay. Just that the Bible says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. But it comes with a price. It comes with a cost. Just as we heard from the sermon uh, this afternoon. Uh, let me give you two scenarios to prove uh, my point. Uh, there was this gentleman who went to Jesus, asked him if he can be saved. So Jesus asked him about uh, the Lord. Do you know the, the Ten Commandment? He was able to say, oh, I've known this through uh, my infancy. But when it came to the point that go and put that into practice, he went and never came back. So even though he knew the truth, but did he put that into practice? No. So at the end of the day, it looks like he has lost his life. And the second scenario is uh, this, the three Hebrew boys. They know the truth. At the first time, when the king prepared that delicious food before them, and he wanted them to enjoy, they got to know that their body is not uh, is a temple of God. So anything that they want to use in their body, it should be what God has asked them to do. And so they told the king, no, just give us food, uh, give us drinks and some fruit. We saw what happened after 10 days. And the next one was uh, when Nebuchadnezzar uh, set up a, a huge uh, image and he wanted them to bow before the image. They know that the truth is, the truth is you should worship only God and no other image. And so they were told several times that you see the fire before you. If you don't bow, you're going to be killed. But since they know the truth, they stood for the truth, and at the end of the day, uh, they were saved. So if you just proclaim on us uh, by saying it and not put it into action, I think we'll be like that uh, rich young man who went to Jesus and asked for how he could be saved. And when he was asked to put that into practice, he went and never came back. So as Christians, we know the truth. Let's put that into practice, and I think we shall be saved. Amen. I think that if we know the truth, and we don't go by it, it's, it's a sin. And if you try and fix, like try and pray for forgiveness and you feel like you believe that you're forgiven, that's good. But if you commit the same sin again, then you're just trying to repeat the cycle and try and like act like you're, you're not aware of what you're doing, but you're really aware. So if you read the scriptures and you know the sins that you're supposed to, stay away from and then you go again and you repeat the same sins it's not um something that god would look for us to do and in our and we on our live um someone said we should read luke four sixteen. luke four sixteen, and he came to nazareth where he had begun and where he had been brought up and as his custom was, 
he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for stood up for to read. Amen. Amen. So that is the end of our Sabbath school, and we hope for you to come and join next week. Bye. Oh. Um, we are here for the closing prayer. Elder Ayan, can you give us a closing prayer? Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we are so much grateful unto thee for giving us such a wonderful discussion in your word. We are praying that let the Holy Spirit be with us so that we could do whatever you want us to do, so that at the end of the day, we shall be counted among your chosen ones. Thank you for the answer prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yeah.